I've told plenty of scary stories in my career. Tales that chill your bones as they've chilled mine. Yeah, the lore I impart keeps me up at night, too. And today isn't going to be any different. But monsters come in many shapes and sizes. So I ask for patience when I say, this story starts with something as unremarkable as a box. About a month ago, this box I'm talking about arrived in the mail. It was from my aunt. See, we put Grandma's house on the market. And during the final clean-out, my aunt found this thing. It said, Rodney, on it. So she sent it to me in L.A. It was red and wooden and had a curling, sticky note with my name and Grandma's handwriting on the side. I knew this box. More than a few times I'd seen Grandma ship through his contents when she thought no one was looking. She cried when she did it, too, which confused me, you know, because this thing happened when I was young. My tears at that point, they were kids' tears, visceral, instinctive, a tantrum if I didn't get candy, fear if I fell off a bike, that kind of thing. Grandma's tears were quiet, deep, and very much connected to that box's contents. As you might guess, I'd always wanted, needed, to know what was inside. But now that I have it right here, in my hands, I can't seem to open it. It's been sitting on my desk for weeks. I stare at it every now and then, trying to work up the courage to crack the lid. But I never do. It's just, it feels like the last thing Grandma has to tell me. Once it's over and I know what's inside, that'll be it. She'll have nothing left to say. All this has got me thinking about the things Grandma said already. The many tales she wove. There's one in particular I keep coming back to. You'll see why in a minute. It's what Grandma told me after she caught me watching her with that red box, crying those deep, agonizing tears. It's about when the most formidable, insidious beast in existence came for her and changed the way she saw the world forever a despicable creature called grief. Disappointed? Yeah, I can see that. Grief sounds so normal. We've all grieved. It's a part of life. But in my grandma's case, it was more dire than that. See, one time, when she was young, grief chased her down and tried to kill her. You're listening to One Fool. I'm Rodney Barnes, and this is episode 25, Black Aggie. In 1936, Grandma wasn't Grandma to anyone yet. Her name was Estelle, and she was 16. You wouldn't know it, though. She carried herself like a woman who lived a thousand years. That's because a whole lot of life had happened to Estelle in the short time she'd been alive. Too much. Knowing that, don't be surprised by this next part. This story begins at a funeral. Estelle stood in the front pew as mourners drifted in for the wake. She closed her eyes, listening to their snow-encrusted boots ply down the aisle, to their voices murmur condolences, to their tearful sniffles as they prayed over her little brother's corpse. Estelle's own eyes were dry as a bone. As wild as it sounds, she hadn't been able to cry for her brother, just like she hadn't been able to cry for her other five siblings, or her parents. Eight bodies she'd seen going to the ground in the last 10 years, a different allotment of ailments, accidents, and tragedy. All that death dried her right up. Much later, after her brother was buried and the mourners had left, Estelle pulled her jacket closed and strode into the night. It was March in the Baltimore area, the crappy part of winter, where it's almost spring, but the last stretch of cold seems like it'll last forever. The biting chill stung Estelle's skin, but she didn't flinch. She just got on with it. Her route home from the church took her past the cemetery where her family's graves were, where she just laid her brother to rest. She always picked up the pace here. She knew she would visit them, but she couldn't bring herself to. You can guess why, but I'll tell you anyway. Their gravestones were reminders of a deep, unbearable loss. But that night, 
As she passed the cemetery entrance, something made her pause. The sound of kids. At first, she thought they were playing, which vaguely confused her. As far as Estelle was concerned, life was meant to be endured, not enjoyed. Then she realized the voices were arguing. Two boys about Estelle's age hovered over a much smaller one. The younger kid was crying. He seemed terrified. Estelle, now she hated a bully. She stomped up to the kids and demanded to know what the problem was. She found out real quick. The older boys wanted this kid to go into the cemetery and sit on the statue everyone called Black Aggie. Estelle knew of the statue. Of course she did. She'd buried eight bodies in the cemetery, but she'd never heard about the lore behind it. When she said so, the teens filled her in. Black Aggie, they said, is a bronze statue of a woman. The person who created her originally called her Grief. But don't let that fool you. She's evil. Grass doesn't grow at her feet. Pregnant women can miscarry if they get too close. Black Aggie presides over the dead, too. You run from her, she'll raise the cemetery's ghostly hordes to fetch you back. But maybe the worst thing. If you sit on Black Aggie's lap at midnight and she gives you a hug, you only get two more weeks to live. That last bit is what they needed the little boy for. To sit on her lap at midnight and see if the legend was true. Because they sure as hell weren't going to do it themselves. The younger kid was shaking in fear. And look, Estelle didn't want to be anywhere near the cemetery. But the thing was, this kid reminded her a whole lot of her dead little brother. As the eldest of all her siblings, Estelle had been the de facto parent when her own had passed. I point this out because she had essentially been a mother had that instinct. She wasn't about to let this kid rot. Plus, she didn't believe any of the crap those teens had just told her. My grandma was pretty practical back then. Monsters, superstition, the supernatural, she called hooey on all that at the time. As far as she was concerned, God wouldn't let something like Black Aggie exist in a Christian cemetery. All that's why Estelle found herself weaving around gravestones as midnight approached her. The air seemed to get colder with each passing step. Crows shrieked in the skeletal trees. She took the long way around, avoiding her family plot. So it was a bit of time before the outline of Black Aggie rose against the night sky. Estelle stopped in front of her. There was a lifeless patch of dirt at the statue's base. No grass, just like the legend said. But it was also winter, so she didn't read into that. The statue was made of bronze with a blackish hue to it, though an oxidized bluish green peeked through in places. Aggie was seated on a pedestal, a cloak pulled over her head, but it was her face that Estelle couldn't look away from. Her features were set back in the cloak, almost hidden. Heavy lidded eyes looked down. A hand was gently pressed against her cheek. Her lips were parted in a downward pout. It made sense why Black Aggie's creator named her Grief. It was the saddest expression Estelle had ever seen. She tore her eyes away from the frozen melancholy face, checked her pocket watch, 11.59. The kids would never know if she actually sat on Aggie's lap, but what does she care? Like I said, Estelle didn't buy into Aggie's story. Even if she did, it's not like she had anything left to lose. She climbed onto the statue's lap. It was freezing. The metal absorbed the cold like an ice pack. Estelle's legs went numb immediately. She tried to ignore it and focused on her watch. The seconds ticked by. Five, four, three, two, one. Midnight. Estelle looked up at Black Aggie's face. It was as still and somber as always. She sort of smiled then, just as she'd thought. A blasphemous tale meant to make a holy place feel terrifying. She swung her legs around and went to hop off Aggie's lap, but she couldn't move. When she looked down to find out why, she saw two ice-cold arms had wrapped themselves around her waist. Strangely, Estelle didn't panic, not right away. She just tried to get off Black Aggie's lap, but the arms wouldn't let her. In fact, they squeezed tighter. The heavy metal cut into Estelle's skin, pressing into her diaphragm, squeezing the air from her lungs. 
That's when she panicked. She clawed at the appendages, trying to pry them off her, but they just got tighter. Estelle screamed and craned her neck around to look up at Black Aggie's face. The statue was as stoic as ever, but the eyes weren't cast down anymore. They stared up at Estelle. A glint of red flashed through them, the angry kind. The arms tightened again, making Estelle sputter. Blood rushed to her head. Her vision swam. Black Aggie's red eyes swirled in a colorful wheel of delirium. Then, the pressure released. Estelle pitched forward, plummeting from Black Aggie's lap onto the patch of iced over earth in front of her pedestal. Estelle winced as her stocking snagged and the rough dirt split the skin on her knees. She scrambled to her feet, whipped around. Black Aggie was as she'd been, calm, still, completely a statue. Estelle stood there and just stared. Because as much as she wanted to run, she also wanted to leave knowing she'd imagined the whole thing. Ten minutes went by and nothing happened. This was about all the time Estelle was going to give it. As she hurried away, she told herself all the excuses we've heard time and time again. The dark, the cold, the trauma from being in that graveyard, so close to family. All that had probably made her imagination run wild. By the time she got to the cemetery entrance, she felt better, and the other kids looked relieved when she said the coast was clear. Black Aggie was just a statue. Except, maybe Estelle was more worried than she thought, because she couldn't sleep that night. She could feel the statue's arms wrap around her. She could feel the breath catch in her throat. She was exhausted by the time she got to work the next day. Let me give you some backstory here. Estelle was a housekeeper for some ritzy family smack in the center of Annapolis. See, she'd quit school her sophomore year, and learning wasn't worth much if you couldn't put food on the table. And she'd had siblings to provide for at the time, miles to feed. Now that she'd just had her own, she thought about going back to school, but she enjoyed the work. It was joyfully monotonous. She'd get lost in the repetitive sweeping, cooking errands, too busy for her thoughts to drift. Anyway, today she was tired, but she quickly disappeared into the work like she always did. And before she knew it, the sun was setting and it was time to go home. It was only a half mile to the bus stop, but she knew it'd feel like more than that. It was freezing. She took off at a quick clip, hoping the movement would warm her up. Her boots slapped the ground, ice crunched under her soles. The cold black night seemed to press in on her from all sides. Finally, she saw the bus stop up ahead. There was another figure already waiting there, hoping to catch the 9 p.m. bus, just like she was. Estelle was relieved. She always hated waiting alone. The person stood at the edge of a streetlight's glare, wearing a hood. As Estelle got closer, she could see their head was tilted slightly down. A hand was pressed against their cheek. They stood very, very still almost like a statue. What makes a life a good one? Is it the adventure you have? Or the friends you find along the way? Maybe it's pursuing your passion while striving to protect, defend, and save what you believe in every single day. So, what makes a life a good one? In the Coast Guard, we think it's all of the above and more. But you'll have to find out for yourself. Visit GoCoastGuard.com to learn more. Estelle stopped short. She stared at the figure, at the statue, not wanting to believe what her eyes were telling her because there's no way she could abide by the idea that Black Aggie was waiting at that bus stop. But then the bus roared into view. It stopped between Estelle and Black Aggie. When it continued moving, the statue was gone. Estelle had to wait another hour for the next bus to arrive, and the whole time she sat there with her head on a swivel and her heart in her throat. In fact, Estelle didn't calm down till she was in bed, covers pulled up to her chin, saying her nightly prayers. 
She slept uneasily again, and the next day at work she couldn't get lost in her task like she normally did. She kept thinking about the bus stop, about Black Aggie. But when she left work that night, the stop was deserted, which made her feel a little better, you know? Even so, when Estelle got home, she couldn't completely shake her worry. She sat in her bed, curled her knees to her chest, buried her head in her arms. It was still, quiet. She sighed, then someone else did too. Estelle slowly looked up, straight into a sculpted, sorrowful face, the same one Estelle had seen in the graveyard, the same one she'd seen at the bus stop. It was, without a doubt, Black Aggie. A scream tore from Estelle's throat as a metal hand wrapped around her wrist. She yanked away, but Black Aggie held on. The statue's rough palm cut into Estelle's skin so hard it drew blood. Then Black Aggie leaned in further, bringing her petrified face just inches away from Estelle's. Her lips parted to release a breath. The cold of it made Estelle flinch, but the words that came after were more chilling than the air. Tick tock, sad girl. The next thing Estelle knew, sunlight hit her face. It was morning. She was still in bed, but Black Aggie was nowhere to be seen. She'd left something behind, though. A red, angry mark encircled Estelle's wrist, right where Aggie's hand had been. Estelle choked back some bile. Her practical brain had no more arguments, no more protests. This, listeners, was the moment that started it all. The moment my grandma realized there were unknowable things in this world. Things that lurked in the darker recesses of humanity. Nightmares that are as real as the fear they conjure in your chest. Because like it or not, Black Aggie had been in her bed, and she wasn't going anywhere. The statue visited Estelle again that night, and the next, and the next. Yeah, Aggie tormented my grandma for days. Sometimes she'd appear in her bed. Sometimes she'd wait after work. Soon as the sun went down, Black Aggie was there. She got more violent, too. Wounds appeared all over Estelle's body. A bruise from Aggie's fist here. A welt from a slap there. Estelle tried to stop her. She boarded up her windows, locked her doors, and did no good. Black Aggie found her anyway. Hurt her a little bit more each time. And always whispered the same foreboding words in her ear. Tick-tock, sad girl. About this phrase, Estelle knew what it meant at this point. It was the part of the legend Estelle hoped wasn't true. If Black Aggie gives you a hug, you have two weeks to live. Tick-tock. Estelle's time was running out, and then it did. The two-week mark arrived, and Estelle was hanging on by a thread. She was worn thin. This coming from someone who'd experienced more loss in 16 years than most get in a lifetime. All of that hadn't killed her, but Black Aggie was about to. Estelle didn't know what to do with that, so she did the only thing she could think of. She went to church. Hours before midnight, two weeks to the day she sat on Black Aggie's lap, Estelle knelt before the altar and told God everything. The entire story. The kids, the cemetery, the statue. When she finished, a voice answered. But it wasn't God. It was the pastor. And if Estelle was hoping to get some reassuring words, then she was disappointed. He said, You accepted what Black Aggie had to offer by sitting on her lap, by feeling her embrace. She wants your soul, my dear. And she and her ghostly hordes will get it. There's nothing anyone can do, not even God. Estelle left after that, trudged outside. The cold woke her up a bit. She looked at her watch. Its hand ticked towards the hour Black Aggie would find her. Estelle stood there thinking about that and everything that had happened and the horror that was about to come. She started to get, well, she was pissed. Black Aggie thought Estelle was like any other person, terrified of death. But the more Estelle thought about it, the more she realized she wasn't like everyone else. 
Death had come for those she loved eight times over. If it wanted to come for her too, so be it. So yeah, Estelle wasn't going to wait for Black Aggie to come for her. Estelle had gotten through the worst of life by getting on with things, and she wasn't about to stop now. Pretty soon, Estelle was storming through the cemetery, walking past her family's tombstones. She stood in front of Black Aggie. She stared at that sad, downcast face, and she waited for the last hour of the day to pass. Tick, tock. Grandma never told me what she was thinking about as she waited for midnight to come. I bet there was a little fear there and a little heartache. But when I asked her, she told me that wasn't part of the story I needed to know. Anyway, midnight came soon enough. I still stared at her watch, counting down the seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. When midnight hit, she closed her eyes, waited for the cold bronze hands to wrap around her neck. Except they didn't. And when Estelle looked around, she didn't see Black Aggie rising up to kill her. In fact, she didn't see the statue at all. The pedestal was empty. She took a step back, unnerved, then another. And then... She felt something that made her stomach flip. A hard, cold tap, tap, tap on her shoulder. Estelle slowly turned around. There was Black Aggie, inches from her face, eyes burning red. Her normally sad, downturned mouth had been replaced by a sneer. Tick-tock, sad girl. Time is over. Estelle had come to the cemetery prepared to die, but instinct is a powerful thing. The moment she met Black Aggie's gaze, she ran. She got a few steps in before something stopped her. Figures had appeared around the cemetery behind her. People that walked towards her with a staggering gait. Or, they weren't exactly people. More like shadows. A moving part of the darkness, vaguely shaped like a person. Neither ghost nor zombie. Just something dead. Black Aggie's army. The deceased who lived in the cemetery, coming to drag Estelle to the bowels of hell. Estelle took a deep breath. It did nothing to quell the tremors that shook her body. But she tried to wrestle down her visceral fear and focus on Black Aggie. She hoped she looked stoic, with her head held high. She wanted the statue to know she was stronger than most, even in the end. And Aggie, well, she opened her arms, ready to squeeze my grandma to death with her vicious embrace. As the statue neared Estelle, some of the ghostly minions gathered round, readying to support their cemetery queen. But then Estelle realized they weren't flanking Black Aggie. They were facing her, cutting off her path to Estelle. There were eight of them. Estelle stared at their shadowy backs. She couldn't make out clothes or features even, but she could see that two were taller, the rest were small, like children. Estelle's breath caught in her throat, because she knew these shadows. She didn't need to see their faces. She could feel them with every fiber of her being. It was her dearly departed family. Together, as one, they surged forward, towards Black Aggie. The statue shoved at her, writhed as their hands grabbed at her. They moved faster and faster, soon becoming a tornado of darkness. Aggie twitched, struggled, then let out a shrill, ear-splitting scream. Choking and gasp followed, and then the shadows dissipated. Black Aggie was back on her pedestal. She looked furious, her hands pressed on either side of her seat, ready to spring back up again. Estelle felt something at her sides, her family. They gathered all around her. She could feel the chill of a misty hand on her shoulder, the gentle stroke of a palm on the small of her back. Her family was standing with her, daring Black Aggie to try again. Listeners, Aggie didn't accept that dare. As the first of the morning light shot through the sky, Aggie relented. Her face turned placid, her hand rose to her cheek, and she was still once more. A denizen of grief, on her pedestal, in a place of death. Estelle felt the air warm around her and realized her family had vanished. She called out, begging them not to go, to take her with them. 
but they didn't answer. The ache she felt then was so profound, she fell to her knees. They'd saved her. Grief had tried to swallow her whole, but the shadows had stood in the way. They reminded Estelle that getting on with it doesn't mean giving in, and it certainly doesn't mean forgetting. As Estelle knelt there in the cemetery, trembling, she saw something in the cold, barren dirt by Aggie's feet, a green seedling poking through the earth, a sign of spring. Because winter doesn't last forever, you know. Estelle felt her heart thaw, and she did something she hadn't done in years. She cried. This story has always been one of my favorites, but let me tell you, it's a lot harder now that I'm sitting here holding this box. See, I feel the same way about this thing that Grandma did about going to her family's plots. I know whatever's in here is going to remind me of what I lost. It's going to hurt. And I'm not much of a masochist. But if Grandma could face her tragedy head on, I can too. Here goes nothing. Well, would you look at that? Want to know what's in here? Pictures of Grandma, her parents, her siblings, parts of her past that happened long before I existed, but that I'm connected to all the same. I get why she cried when she looked at these. Of course I do. Now more than ever. And Grandma knew it'd take me a while to get it. That's why she slapped my name on the side of this box, rather than trying to explain it to me as a little boy. Let me gather my thoughts here. Yeah, it's like this. Even though she isn't here, the stories she told me haunt me. She haunts me. Or at least my memories of her do. In this box, it's my horde of ghosts. Something I didn't want to face. Something I thought would prevent me from putting my head down. And just getting on with it. But you know what? I'm glad I opened it. Because if this is the last thing Grandma has to tell me, it's pretty sensational advice. Grief isn't always the monster it's thought to be. The pain it causes, it's a reminder you lost something or someone you loved, sure. But it also reminds you of what you had and how lucky you are to have had it. Run Fool is a production of Ballin Studios, Campside Media, and Atwell Media. It is hosted and executive produced by me, Rodney Barnes. This episode was written by Kate Murdoch and produced by Abakar Adan and Lee Mengistu. Sound director, designer, and mixer is Kevin Seaman. Creature vocalization by Terry Cashburn and artwork by Jessica Clarkston Kiner. Production support by Jeremy Bone and Cole Lacasio. Special thanks to our operations team, Doug Slaywin, Ashley Warren, Sabina Mara, and Destiny Dingle. Executive producers at Ballin Studios are Mr. Ballin, Nick Witters, and Zach Levin. Executive producers at Atwell Media are Will Malnati and Rosie Garrett. Executive producers at Campside Media are Matt Scher, Josh Dean, Vanessa Gregoriadis, and Adam Hoff. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.